Hello, everybody. Welcome to All Villa, No Filler. Please remember to like and subscribe. Click that subscribe button if you love the mighty Villa, if you think we're going to win the Champions League and you hate the Blues. If you don't click subscribe, you support Birmingham City. Read the small print there on the YouTube um, terms and conditions. It says paragraph 5 to a rule, something like that, from what I remember, it says you're a blues. So click that subscribe button. Anyway, now that I've got all that out of the way, well, I've been away for a week. Uh, I was in Greece. I was in Corfu. Very pretty indeed. Got a decent amount of sunburn while I was out there. Had some lovely food. Had a lovely old time of it. Um, but I saw that a lot of things were happening in the world of Aston Villa. It was difficult to relax out there in that sunshine on those beaches when all I kept seeing popping up on my phone was Douglas Weiss linked here, Jean Duran linked there, Matty Cash going to the moon, uh, Professor Unai Emery going on holiday to Mars, like all, all this chat, chin wagging and all that kind of stuff. So uh, I thought I'd do a little chat about it. So yesterday uh, I chatted to... Uh, Lorenzo Bertoni, he's the editor of Football Italia, an English-speaking website for covering Italian football. He was brilliant. He gave me the big lowdown on the latest for uh, the deal for Douglas Luiz to Juventus, as well as Samuel Illing Jr. and Weston McKenney coming to Aston Villa. Um, so that was uh, very interesting and something that I recommend you all go and watch, uh, if I do say so myself. Um, so, uh, well, first you might as well talk about Douglas Ruiz. Uh, we don't know the exact figure uh, he'd be going for. By all accounts, the the various reports I've seen, the best I can deduce from all the reports I've seen is that it's 20 million euros plus two players worth themselves, about 20 million each. So roughly on paper... PSR-wise, that would come down as a 60 million profit, I assume, before um, the accounts are due on June 30th. And uh, therefore, uh, with that profit, um, we hopefully are uh, okay on FFP. It's hard to tell. I mean, look, the again, you go, we're going off media reports here um, about the, the situation there. So Nassif Sawiris talking about it uh, with the Financial Times, potential legal action against the Premier League as well. Uh, look, I mean, that's a completely separate topic that I think I'll try and cover with a guest. I I'd rather not go too deeply into that because I, I, it's not really an area of expertise for me or, to be honest, most people. It's it's a complex issue. But look, I think um, Douglas Ruiz, uh, I think he's got two years left on his deal um so peak value now uh he's a he's a world-class player he's been a fantastic servant to aston villa uh joining us in 2019 um we've watched him develop into one of the best midfielders in world football uh, a brazilian international i mean the thought that aston villa would have a centre midfielder brazilian and international developing with our club even just a couple of years ago when um you know various players were picture doing laughing gas in hotel rooms while we were abysmally relegated and stuck in the championship for years with Dr. Tony Gia writing the most absurd tweets known to humanity. Um, if you could ever imagine that a player like Douglas Ruiz would come to Aston Villa and develop into the player it's been. He, he was a fantastic signing um, made by, uh, I want to say, Pitarch. He was the uh, sporting director at the time. Um, fell out with Perslow. Um, I think it's fair to say Perslow didn't do a brilliant job on all of his signings. Um, I'll talk about that in a second as well, actually. Um, but yeah, I think um, Luis, uh, in his first season, obviously it was a, a season of growth. Uh, once the COVID break happened and he came back, I think he was our best player in that spell where we fought to stay up and just about did it. You know, Trezeguet got the all-important goals. Grealish was the talisman. Everybody, you know, Esri Consa played brilliantly as well at that time, but uh, I thought it was Douglas Luiz who really shone. Um, then his form was quite patchy over the years, um, but then it was really when uh, Uno Emery came in that he excelled um, and showed everything that he that he is. And um, having endured poor coaching under Steven Gerrard and not even been picked to start um, in games that I went to watch, amazingly, um, 
he was on the bench um, by by that genius Gerard. Um, Uno Emery comes in, immediately realizes how good uh, Louise is, plays him in the exact position he needs to be played in, alongside a CDM in Bubakar Kamara. And uh, for the last two year and a half, he's been exceptional. Um, I think you could say probably in the last couple of months, his um, form wasn't quite as high after Kamara got injured. But also, you have to remember. I think a lot of our players just towards the tail end of the season were starting to look quite tired given the sheer volume of games we played. And of course, you know, going for fourth place, it was always going to be uh, difficult. But, you know, um, I think Louise, uh, I think he's been a brilliant player for Villa and um, I shall miss him greatly. If indeed he does go, it's not confirmed yet. Who knows? It might all turn around in a second or something. Isn't it? It's not happening. Um, but uh, yes, um, I think it's I think it's a real shame we're losing a world-class talent. But um McKenney and um Samuel Illing Jr., uh the two players that are coming in. I think we have to have uh, faith in Uno Emery Monchi um in what's happening here. Uh I think next season, if I were to theorize what the midfield might look like, I think it would be Yuri Tielemans goes into the Louise role. Tielemans is a top, top player as well, isn't he, really? And then uh I don't yet know who's going to play CDM whilst Kamara's injured, but I'd say that the starting centre midfield where all our players fit would be probably Seelemans and um, Kamara. But that said, uh, who's to know? I mean, it looks like Villa are selling players at the moment uh, in June. John Duran, it looks like that's happening again if media reports are to go by anything. I'll talk about him in a sec. Uh, you know, his deals with potentially with Chelsea, also maybe even Matty Cash going to Milan uh, and who knows who else. Um, so, uh, yes, it, it looks like sales are the order of the day right now. But what I would say is that I think it's probably accruing the finances now so that in July um, we might go quite strong for a couple of players. So whilst I say Tielemans and Kamara probably are the top two centre midfielders we have now. Uh, I think it's worth waiting around to see exactly what transfers are made. And if perhaps, you know, we go for someone like an Alex Bayena at Villarreal, that's certainly one I think to keep an eye on. Um, who's who's to say that, you know, Tielemans might not then actually end up still playing as that second striker and Bayena goes into a Louise role or vice versa, you know. So I, I certainly think that the technical capability of Louise is probably something we need to replace. Um, Western McKenney coming in, as Lorenzo Bertoni told me, he had, you know, very, you know, revitalized himself somewhat at Juventus last season. I know he had, didn't have a great spell at Leeds, but you can't judge players of occasional bad spells at certain clubs. Um, you know, look at various players over the years that have um, done that. Look at uh, even Uno Emery himself, who at Arsenal didn't have the greatest year. Um, if we'd have judged him on that, Though I think he was a bit underrated with how well he actually did at Arsenal. I think he was unfairly maligned there. But that said, you could probably have looked at that and gone, ah, oh, Emery at Villa, really? Now we call him the professor. Now I want a tattoo over my face. Now I want to spray paint his face everywhere. Um, annoying my girlfriend all the time by just talking about Unai Emery every time we go for a meal or uh, go to the cinema. I interrupt every move and you go to, you know, halfway through Furiosa, brilliant film. Go watch it, by the way. So, it's a, uh, by the way... Uh, what do you think Uno Emery's doing right now? What what's your tactic tactical decisions? Do you think he's sitting there writing about just boring the life out of people about it? But um no, I love the man. Um so as I say, Weston McKenney, you can't judge him over what happened at Leeds because Leeds were shambles at the time. Jesse Marsh was the manager, so maybe there was the US connection there. There were a couple of US players there, including Tyler Adams, I think. But Leeds were just a team in utter decline. He went into a team that Frankly, things just weren't going right. And if you were to judge players, you know, who were at Aston Villa, say like a Douglas Louise or a John McGinn during the Stephen Gerrard era at Aston Villa, you could easily have written them off as well at times. Some of them, some games that weren't even starting because Gerrard didn't know what he was doing. Other games, um, McGinn had unnecessary pressure placed on him, was playing in positions that didn't suit him. Um, so, you know, just don't write off players because of bad spells here and there. With McKenney. And this is the word I'm going to keep using all summer, versatility. Injury crises are striking football clubs constantly now. Who knows what the reason is? I don't know. I suspect it might be something to do with the sheer volume of games that 
football players are having to endure right now. The intensity of those games, the intensity of Premier League games, the intensity of Champions League, the intensity of Europe, the intensity of internationals, the volume of it, uh, all of that is definitely going to just add to injury lists, right? Um, sometimes it might just be a, a misfortune, um, but I just can't help but think that players play too much football these days. Um, there's going to come a breaking point for it at some point in the next couple of years. Um, well, I think we've already reached it, but some maybe the players themselves will kind of unionise in a way and, and come forward and say that we can't play this many games. Who knows? Who knows? But um, look, the reason versatility is so important is because the sheer volume of games asked if they're going to play in a few weeks. Now, a couple of people said I was quite negative a couple of weeks ago when I made my ridiculously early Premier League predictions and said top six for Aston Villa. Look, I think what... And I think, look, fair enough, fine. I get that. But look, what I do think is that Villa are... Um, you know, not only do we have this PSR thing going on at the moment, but also we're, we're going to be playing an intense volume of games against top, top class teams the first half of the season. But again, it's it's a development process. It's it's early days in the Unai Emery revolution still. And this is going to be a learning process. I think we're going to have some great nights in the Champions League. Of course, then we're going to have some big wins. I think, I think you know, who's to say how far we can go in it? I believe. Um, but it, it is going to it'd be uh, a new challenge for us. You know, we're going into the season as we're not underdogs now. Um and obviously, we're having to sell a couple of players. So let's just see what happens this summer and where it goes. But versatility is important because if we do have an injury crisis again, as we persistently had last season, um, you can have a player players who can slot into various positions. So let's take Weston McKinney. He can play a wide range of roles in the in in the midfield. Right? He can probably play where Louise plays. He can probably sit. Um, where, you know, in the CDM role, if he has to, probably play as a second striker, probably play, uh, in you know, on the left role, left midfield or on the right midfield, maybe in fill in a right back. It's just all these different positions he's played in last season as well. He got, you know, what was it, seven, eight assists in Serie A, though he didn't score a goal. Um, so, look, I he's not Douglas Wee's level ability, right? But he is a versatile player. He, he's good aerially, which is good for us, you know, with our set pieces, we don't defend set pieces well enough. We constantly can see goals from set pieces. Having people who are good at defending aerially is probably a good thing. Um, and that said, is he necessarily going to be a starting player for us next season? Or is he a bit like Ross Barkley? Is he a player who will come in and perhaps spend a lot of time on the bench, but coming on for 30 minutes or maybe starts a game here and could play 60 minutes. And then, you know, a Tiedemans comes on Um you know, a bit like a bit like what Barkley is likely going to do at Villa next season, and having two players like that in your squad, who who are fit, physical, good on the ball. Well, particularly Barkley has been good on the ball playing deep. Having players like that just for a ver for with versatility, um, players that you can balance the minutes up. It's probably not. It's not a bad thing to be honest. You know, compare it to what we have right now, and you've got what Dendonka. It's an upgrade on that. Tim Robinham, it's probably an upgrade on him, though, you know, he's a young player. We have to be patient with him and see where he goes in his career. Um, but for where those players are now, it's an upgrade on them. Um, so, yes, look, I'm not delighted to see Douglas Luiz go. I think he's a great, great player. But um, I think I can see the thinking behind McKenney. What I do think, though, is that we have to be patient with where this transfer window is going to go. I think it. I think rather than rushing to judgment right now, see it where all the jigsaw pieces lie in late July and early August. Now, um, Samuel Illing Jr. I'm excited by Illing Jr., to be honest. Um, he's played a lot on, again, watch the interview with Lorenzo Bertoni. Uh, he talks about him at length and he's very high on um, Illing Jr., um, I'm just going to read to you a little bit of an article. Actually, there's a, I'll post a link below. It's a Guardian article um, Ed Aaron's wrote about Illing Jr. back in January, because at that point Illing Jr. had played a lot for Juventus. He was a twenty, you know, twenty year old English player playing abroad regularly for the top team in Italy. Essentially, is newsworthy stuff, isn't it? And uh, one of the things he wrote about was that, and I'll, I'll just read the paragraph for you here. Illing Jr.'s versatility. There's that word again 
has led to him being deployed as a wing back by Allegri, the Juve manager or former Juve manager, and he's comfortable playing a number of positions. There we go. Isaac Hurst, who is uh, the personal coach for um, for uh, Ealing Junior. He believes um, that can only be an advantage. He said Samuel is unique because he's so technical and can use both feet, so he could probably play anywhere, he says. He's got everything. So there you go. Um, he's largely left-sided. He's versatile. Um, he's immersed himself in Italian culture. Uh, he's taught, you know, his personal coach also talks about his humility and, um, Learning all of it, learning Italian. He's very polite. Polite. There's no ego. Good family. All of those things, all of those attributes: intelligence, versatility, raw ability, and experience of playing at the top level with Juventus in the Champions League and Serie A. All of those things coming into Aston Villa, that to me sounds like a really, really exciting project for Unai Emery to work on. This to me sounds like the type of thing Unai Emery where Emery excels and can get the very, very best out of someone like Ealing Jr., who clearly wants to listen, according to this article, and clearly has the attitude to do that and the intelligence to do it. Um, so where does he fit? Will he be coached and in, moulded into a, a regular left back? Uh, well, he's played left wing back. So Villa's left backs tend to be quite progressive, don't they? Alex Moran has been linked with going back to Real Betis. So will Ealing Jr. be that player who goes into left back but plays more as a, almost like a, a left midfielder at times? Like some, when you see Villa's lineup in possession, quite a lot of the time, the two centre backs step back. The right back tends to come in, into a back three, and the left back is, you know, bombed on, has basically joined the midfield. Ealing Jr.'s natural role seems to be where that left back sits. Now, defensively, how strong is he? I don't know. Um, but. He's versatile enough to perhaps learn to play as that left back role, but his natural role sounds like it might be sort of the more left midfield role, where Morgan Rogers sits, Jacob Ramsey sits, and Ealing Junior now would sit. So my goodness, what versatility there is there? Because I would say Ramsey would I stick him anywhere other than that? Possibly not. Though he could sit him deeper in midfield, in centre midfield. Um, he's played there before, but I still think his best role is between the lines in that left midfield role, coming deep, getting the ball on the half turn and starting forward. Rogers obviously plays that role as well. But with Rogers, I wonder if his future, I've said this before, and I'll say it again, I've described him as the heir to Watkins, right? Or potential heir to Watkins, because his attributes are back to goal. He is really good at holding the ball up. He's physical, he's tall, his finishing is exceptional. Three goals he's got for Villa in the Premier League have been brilliant finishes. Um, he's very quickly adapted to the Premier League, quickly learned under Emery. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if it's maybe even this season, we start to see Rodgers playing as a striker or as a second striker. Um, I wouldn't. Say, I wouldn't say it's going to start the season that way. I still imagine he might start the season in left midfield, depending on how Ram fit Ramsey is. But who's to know? Maybe he doesn't. Maybe he does go into that more progressive role at the, at the front of the pitch, striker, second striker, and um, back up to Watkins if Duran's going. And um, essentially, Illing Junior and Jacob Ramsey fight it out in that left midfield role. But the good thing is. I'm talking about all these players who can play in different positions. Ealing Jr., maybe he can go into left back. Or maybe even Aston Villa changed their formation at some point. Who's to say Emery might not be working on something this summer thinking, Do you know what, I'm going to mix it up a little bit next season and throw our opponents off. You know, you, football is a constant form of evolution. Um, but, you know, the watchword I would say for all this is versatility, physicality, because again, and you note this with Weston McKenney as well, who's quite a hustle bus on midfield, a bit physical. These are players that we've been linked with. Again, even Barkley as well, he's quite a tall guy, quite quite strong. Again, players that I'd say with Aston Villa at times this season, I always used to say we went from composed to casual. And composed would be we two nil up, we're in control, and then the other team just goes for it and physically overawes us. Or it's like we don't react in game. We, we just don't react in game quickly enough to what is happening. Um, and we get it looks like we get physically overawed at times. I, th I would say that is, has been a weakness of Villa since about December 
when Man United came back and beat us 3-2. So I wonder if a lot of these signings are with that in mind. We'll see. Um, Jon Duran, could he be heading to Chelsea? Lots of reports going around, lots of figures floating around. I've seen £25 million pounds today. I've seen, uh, what, €50 million Euros yesterday. So who's to know? Um, I do think Duran is a player who's worth about 35 to 40 million quid personally uh the reason i think that is because it's chelsea chelsea spend big so that's what we should charge to them same as man united premium um chelsea are a are a direct rival and um given duran's i think very very high ceiling and potential given the fact he's played in the premier league for a year and a half now he has that experience he's scored crucial goals for us he's shown his natural ability um I, I think with all that in mind he is 35 to 40 million quid and that you know we bought him for 17 we need to make a good profit on that and i think 25 million that i saw uh seems to me quite low so I think it is closer to, I would think it was closer to 35, 40, but um, we'll see. We'll see how that all goes. Uh, I think it's a shame if Duran goes. I think he, I, I kind of love him in a way. He's just, you know, a, a, the agent of chaos. But, um, you know, Duran, it's, uh, you read about things. How great does he get on on the training grounds with Emery and the coaches? Read various things on that. Um, you you know you see him on Twitter liking all these Chelsea posts. Uh, does it suggest to me somebody who is fully focused yet? Maybe needs um, just. A bit more guidance. I don't know, um, but yeah, I think I think he's. So I I don't know. Maybe maybe with Emery he just thinks well. Yeah, it's not not a player that he particularly wants to work with. Really, um, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. But uh, he certain Duran certainly has incredible talent, um, incredible talent, and I think he could go on to be one of the best strikers in world football if he's able to focus and harness all of that natural ability he has. I think I think again, I think it'd be a shame if he did leave, but if we got a big bid for him, um, I'm confident that Aston Villa would go and find a backup replacement um that again comes in and maybe scores his as many goals as Duran did last season for Villa. So I think he, he is replaceable, but I think part of me does wonder will he end up going on to score 20, 25 goals for Chelsea. But the fact is He's not going to get the game time at Villa as well. So I can understand that frustration solely because he's not going to get past Solly Watkins. Watkins is the main man, isn't he? And maybe it's, who knows, at Chelsea, will he get past Jackson? Is there more chance he gets past Nicholas Jackson than the result at Watkins at Villa? Probably is, actually. So it might not end up being, you know, the worst move for him, but we'll see. We'll see. If it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Um, and I'm happy if he stays and equally fine if he does end up going for a decent fee. Matty Cash to uh, Milan. 30 million seems to be what Villa want, according to John Townley and uh, Jacob Tanswell as well in The Athletic. Um, 30 million quid uh, were Matty Cash to go for that. Uh, again, I get it. Fine. I, I think there's been times this season where you could see Cash uh, maybe wasn't um, the strongest in that position sort of felt like you probably could get someone who's a little bit better maybe when they reach the final third beating a man hard to find those players I think Cash is, I've, I've always kind of felt Cash is a bit underrated in some ways I think I think defensively is at times better than uh, he gets credit for uh, and you know um he does have a lot of ability. He does. He does. He's been. He's been. I, I like Cash. I like him. I think he's been a great servant of Villa since he came in under Dean Smith. But um, yeah. I. Uh, I mean, if Milan were to bid thirty million again, you know, I, I think I think that's good money. And um, see what you know, Monchi has in store for us. But if it doesn't come off, well, we've kept a, a very capable right back. Um, let me know what you think down below uh, in the comments. Uh, please write away. Um. Another thing uh, to bear in mind as well is, you know, 
with McKenney and Ealing Jr., Zaniolo's gone as well. So, you know, do one of them come in to sort of replace that Zaniolo role? Maybe. You know, Zaniolo played on the left a lot last season, even though I think his strong position was right in the field. Didn't really get to play there much for Villa, though. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's kind of all the transfer chat at the moment. I'm going to get another guest on this week to talk it all through, get some clarity on things, some thoughts on how the squad can develop, where we're all, where this might all be going. Um, but I'm, you know, you know, uh, apprehensive to see, you know, key players for Villa to go, of course, and sad to see Douglas Luiz go in particular. Um, but at the same time, I think you've got to be, you've got to be patient, rational about these things. There's a thought process behind it all with, Monchi, who's been there, done it, Uno Emery, and all this stuff. We're signing generally young players a lot. Nadelkovic as well is coming in, remember, you know, um, seven million quid right back, tall, rangy, physical right back. I know he's young, 18. But from what I've seen him, you can see that. You can see his physicality uh, and his height. Um, Ealing Jr. as well, quite a physical, quick player. Weston McKenney, quite, I would think, quite, I think I was quite a physical player again. So just. Bear that all in mind um, for sort of the profile of players we're sort of looking at. Uh, though I think uh, I think there's going to be some interesting moves probably in the next week or two, and particularly over July, probably maybe when the Euros are over. Um, yeah, I'm quite looking forward to seeing exactly where well, Monchi, Uno Emery and our fantastic coaching staff and support and development team have in store. Um, but yes, right. And also what I would say... On the PSR route, uh, and I mentioned earlier Christian Perslow. Uh, I think Perslow did a lot of brilliant things at Villa, uh, particularly investing in the youth immediately from the start. I think he helped set us on our way back to being a top, top club. Um, so I think he deserves a lot of credit. But I also think there was a period of time there. He made a bad hire in Steven Gerrard, very bad hire in Steven Gerrard. Though I can understand why he did it, given Ger you know how well Gerrard had done at Rangers in the previous season. Um, but it was a gamble. He made a poor purchase in Danny Ings. I, I still to this day don't understand why the Ings thing happened. And there's a strong suspicion in in my head that um, you know, he just appeared randomly out of nowhere after we saw Grealish on the day we saw Grealish, you know, for 30 million quid. Was it a way to just cheer us all up? But signing Ings at the time didn't make sense, uh, because we had Ollie Watkins. Watkins was our main striker. And it didn't look like we were going to change the formation in the end. So it didn't make sense at all. Lucky that we sold him for 15 million quid because we had him on big wages as well. So we signed in that spell from Ings came in under Smith. But then from there, during the Gerard era, we brought in Dendonka, big wages, Luca Dean, Callum Chambers, Dendonka, Kamara, who was a top signing, to be honest. Um, and Diego Carlos, Coutinho, all on big, big wages for players that I don't think made a big enough differential for us, really. Um, only Kamara, could you say, out of all of that, was an unmitigated success. I mean, Dean's played well this season, but again, these are all players on big wages. And some of them came in for big transfer fees as well. And, you know, in the end, that's kind of what we're having to deal with right now um, and I wonder if the aim of this summer is to sort of bring the wage bracket down as much as you can again I don't know if that's that's true I'm just speculating and also to you know bring in a profile player that perhaps can compete physically at times um, as well as have that composure and control uh, and also maybe slightly bring down the age profile and uh, yeah uh, that's that so I thought I'd just mention that aspect to it as well. Um, so yes, there we go. Let me know what you think. Please like and subscribe. Up the mighty Villa. Mm -hmm.